It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Mary Fisher Day from www.thedentalbusiness.com. Mary's career in dentistry has spanned more than three decades. Before beginning her consulting career, she worked as a chairside assistant, scheduling and financial coordinator, and office manager. She has authored articles, blogs, and columns for multiple dental publications and has been featured on several podcasts. Mary is the author of The Dental Business, A Blueprint for Success, which you can find on Amazon.com. This well-received book offers tools, resources, and solutions for dental practice owners and managers and is now available on Amazon. Mary moved often during the early years of career. Although it was difficult at the time, it did have one large benefit. She witnessed the effects of management style on practice culture. The way a practice is managed affects every aspect of a dental practice, most notably employee loyalty and patient satisfaction, and ultimately whether a practice will be successful. Realizing a desire to expand her career yet remain in the dental industry, Mary returned to college to study business management. Armed with 17 years of experience and knowledge of the inner workings of a dental practice, she was ready to begin the next phase of her career. She began consulting with a large dental practice management and transition company and worked as a practice management consultant with the firm until they turned their focus to practice transitions. Mary founded the dental business in 2002. She and her team of experienced dental professionals provide coaching services for dental team and see fast results by providing custom solutions and management systems based on the needs of the practice. Their ultimate goal is to see dental teams enjoy going to work each day have a patient base that happily refers others, enjoys worrying free time away from the office, and the prosperous practice they dream of. Mary, thanks for coming to my show because the only thing I ask my four boys to be and my dental colleagues, homies, is just just be happy and healthy. But since they're <coughs> dentists, they always think the secret to success is a new dental procedure. Same day crowns, placing implants, learning sleep apnea. And I keep going back to them and saying, the number one thing to do is get your house in order. And I would take a return on investment with a dental practice consultant anytime over learning a new recipe. Same thing with a restaurant. If a restaurant was failing, you wouldn't say, well, you need to go back to school and know how to make, learn how to make lasagna. If you just added lasagna to your menu, you're gonna crush it, dude. And whether or not they sell lasagna or not has nothing to do if a restaurant's gonna stay in business, does it? Absolutely not. Not everyone likes Italian. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! And by the way, the the uh, when you go to Mexico, the deeper you go down into Mexico, the le less they know about any of the Mexican food items you eat in Arizona. By the time you get to Acapulco, they've never even heard of what you're talking about. And lasagna in uh, Italy is just about a hundred times better than the lasagna in Phoenix. But uh, so talk about your book, um, your new book. What I, I know. <laughs> that writing a book is like having a baby. I mean, it, it's, it takes longer than nine months to do. Uh, tell us about your book. How, how did that fit to your journey? That's so funny. I just said that exact thing to my husband. I said, I feel like I just delivered a baby. But, and he's like, well, you were pregnant for two years then, because <laughs> that's how long it took to write this. But yeah, it is. I know you've written a, more than one, but yeah, this is my baby. This is my new baby. Um, and hold, it, hold it up. Oh, well, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? I can. I can. The Dental Business, A Blueprint for Success. So what made you sit down and, and have a two-year baby? Um, so I wrote the book because I just, at some point, honestly, 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 I was diagnosed with cancer. So I, I started feeling my life. You know, and I was like, I'm, I want to put stuff I know on paper. So I did. And this book hopefully can take a young dentist from the time they graduate to the time they're ready to, from the, till the time you're ready to retire. The cancer thing's not out there. And it's not even in the book. But I'm just, it's something I'm telling you because it is what caused me to write the book. Um, and how's your cancer doing? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. He's fighting it all the time. It's melanoma. So I grew up in South Carolina near Myrtle Beach. Iodine and baby oil was our sunscreen. So it's self-induced, but we didn't know better. <laughs> so That's what Bob Marley had. I know, on his toe. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of people that have it. Lots of people. 
Yeah, I, I got a I got a uh, very good friend uh, who uh, and uh, he just beat it. He just saw uh, past five years. Yeah, hey, so, I have not passed that mark yet. I'll be happy when I do. Well, if you want, if you ever want to talk to him about it, send me an email, Howard at dentaltown dot com, and I'll reply to you and him and introduce you to because he's uh he's uh he had a, he had a very interesting journey. In fact, now he actually is glad it all happened. I mean, he just he just uh you know what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And he's just an entirely different person now that uh, he had to face that and beat that. Um, it just made him grow as a husband, a father, a businessman. I'm mean, just, it was really a, a great part of his journey. I feel like it's done that for me a lot too. I've had over 74 biopsies. So my body looks just horrid. You can't care, you have to quit caring about things like that. So, and care about real things. And real thing I wanted to do was I really wanted to share my knowledge of 34 years now of what I've learned through the dental practices I've consulted with and the ones I've worked in through my life. I wanted to share all of that. So I just, I addressed everything in here. There's everything from um, getting started, what to do and what not to do, um, understanding insurance participation, building professional relationships, which is something young dentists don't think about often building professional relationships, the ones they're going to need during their career, and how soon, how important it is to start early. Understanding insurance, marketing, practice overhead, just everything all the way to having an exit strategy and a letter of instruction. And um, some, a little idea of things that valuators look for when they're valuing a practice. I, went, I even put that towards the end. There's all kinds of stuff in there about HR, um, tips and sli about things to do and things not to do. I'm gonna put on my glasses now. Um, so I just, I really wanted this to be a handbook for a dentist at any stage in their career. Well, amazing, all, all of your reviews are five star. That's, uh, that's just amazing, congratulations on that. Well, um, well, let, let's let's start let's start with HR because when I go to Dentaltown, <clears throat> and there's 50 forms and one of them's practice management. One of the first questions um, a young dentist asks is, you know, I bought this practice from this old man, and he's given his staff a raise every time the Earth went around the sun, and I could replace all these uh, ladies for half the price with new young ones. What 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 would you say to that dentist? Well, if they've just bought it, you, as you well know, it's difficult to make huge changes in the first six months. You've got to keep some sense of stability to keep the goodwill and the value, especially if the doctor's just walking away. But I just had this conversation via email with one of my clients who bought a practice in May right before this call. And I told him, I said, because he's now starting to make some changes in his staff. I said, now's the time to revise that personnel manual <laughs> because the benefits these ladies were receiving were wonderful, but they were benefits for a very tenured staff and what he's about to have is not a tenured staff. So what I would say to the guy is keep the ben keep things as close as you can to what they were, but also don't do any more than you can afford. You've got to pay your loans you've got to pay your overhead and you've got to pay yourself so just do what you can afford well a lot of a lot of young dentists um they think that since they have so much student loans that they they can't afford and they just need to go work uh as an associate somewhere uh for years and years what and but they really haven't gone out and done due diligence what would you tell some 20 Five, 27, 29 year old dentist uh, listening to you right now is saying, I'm not even looking because I, I got too much in student loans. What would you say? Well, they're going to pay off their student loans a lot faster if they own a practice than they will if they're working for someone. It is, I understand that it's scary, and I, I know the average student loan, some are saying it's like 250000 but I'm seeing like from around here people coming out with 450000 in student loan, and that's just as they're going into their residency a GPR that's not specialist so they've got a lot to pay off and you're just going you make a lot more money as an owner than you will as an associate any day 
Yeah, well, it doesn't make sense because they bought into using other people's money debt to go to dental school. Instead of, instead of working at McDonald's for 7 bucks an hour, 15 bucks an hour, and saving up 10, 20 years to go to dental school, they realized the value of borrowing other people's money to go to dental school now and then pay it back when you're a doctor making 50 to 100 an hour. But then, they, but then a lot of them stop that philosophy the minute they graduate. And it's like, no, if you've come three, four, five hundred thousand dollars down this road, you got to keep going down the road because it's kind of a point of no routine. You you got to you got to borrow seven hundred fifty thousand dollars of more money to get a practice because you're in so much debt. You're going to have to be a successful business owner to pay that debt back in any short amount of time. Yeah, agreed. And you know what's so strange I find about that is that they're willing. A lot of young dentists are willing to do that, and they will finally agree to buy a practice. And I'm not tooting my own horn here, but then they don't want to pay for practice management consultant. And that's the course they didn't take in school. That's the that's the three semesters they needed <laughs> that they didn't get. They may have gotten one or two courses. So, but yeah, I, you, they're always going to make more money as an owner and they need to really consider hiring some practice management, someone with experience, someone who's been there and knows dentistry yeah they won't bar they won't borrow the money for the consultant how, how much is your year how, how much is your standard year-long program it varies but i would say let's just round it to thirty six thousand. okay so so they'll they'll balk at thirty six thousand dollars to learn everything that matters but they won't blink at a hundred thirty six thousand dollar cad cam a hundred thousand dollar cbct a fifty to hundred and thirty thousand dollar laser or go to all through Panky, Koi, Spear, um, you know, I mean, it's just like, be, because, and I get it because I'm a dentist. I mean, yesterday, the most fun I had of the whole 24-hour period is removing four wisdom teeth in like six minutes. I mean, it was, I had I had so much fun. I, I get it, but but they, they got to wear several hats, and they got to wear the business hat. We know that when they get out of school, that they need to, uh, you know, they've only done 50 fillings, they've only done 15 canals of endo, 15 units of removable, and we know they need to get their speed up uh, for a year or two, but how do they get their speed up in being a good leader to set that culture uh, so that you're, like like you said, you, I mean, you said it so perfectly, you said that uh, um, the way a practice is managed affects every aspect of dental practice, most notably employee loyalty, patient satisfaction, and ultimately where their practice will be successful. And nowhere in there does it say whether you're a CAD CAM or a laser dentist or place implants. So how do the, you know, we know they need to go get their clinical speed up, but how do they get their leadership skill up so that they can have uh, a culture of patient loyalty, patient satisfaction, employee loyalty? How, how do they learn those skills? Well, I well, a lot of it's through living and doing it, but I also believe, again, that having someone come in and help you and teach you how to do it. Um, our our management is hand-holding, unfortunately, <laughs> but that's just how I'm made. I'm a hand-holder, and I've hired hand-holders who work for me. So other consultants who work with me were hand-holders. And I like to be in the practice with my doctors and see what they're doing. I think there's a lot to be said for being able to leave the practice and go to seminars and stuff like that too. But having somebody there that sees how, how you practice, sees the culture of your practice, that person can better help you tweak it if they're in their seat and see what's going on in there. And I am not one of these that's going to hand my clients a book and say, here's the book, follow this, and everything's going to be perfect in your practice because there's no cookie cutter practice. I guarantee you that the way you remove those third molars yesterday is very different than the way another doctor would do them. You've removed th four and six minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, I, uh, that, I, I love wisdom teeth the most. That is my number one. That's why I don't golf, because I'd rather be in the office pulling wisdom teeth. Um, so, um, but back, back to leadership. Um, how, um, how young of a dentist, I mean, you say a lot of it's doing it. I mean, do you see many 25-year-old good leaders in dentistry? Do you see any of them at 28? Um, what's, what's the youngest What's the youngest you've ever seen a dentist be a good leader? And what is the average age of a dentist as a good leader? And then lastly, 
Have you ever seen a really bad leader turn into a good leader? Oh, that last question is something. Um, I think <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen practices or doctors who own practices. I've never seen a good 25-year-old leader. I just have it. Not a, a dental team. They may have been good with the ASDA. They may have been good with something else. But leading a dental team is something different because generally the staff's going to be older than you, right? And um, I think that's hard. So you need to be you need to go into the practice knowing some do's and don'ts, I think, and show them from the beginning that you can be a good leader. If you can't be a good leader when you're first in there, get help in there. Get somebody in there to show you how to be a good leader, how to how to treat the staff, how to treat the patients, things that that really matter to staff. Don't ever call a staff member down in front of a patient or other staff members, in my opinion. I think you should, um, that's a one-on-one -on -one private thing. So there's, and as far as having ever seen a bad leader turn good, I saw a, a not good leader turn better. <laughs> I can't say that they, I cannot say I've ever turned somebody completely around. It's because they didn't want to be. You know, they they like they like being um, a tyrant, <laughs> for lack of a better word, and having that control. And I think, and quite honestly, you find out that it has a lot to do with what's going on at home, and that they're not in charge anywhere else. And things are horrible at home, so they're darn sure going to be in charge at work. Huh, that's an interesting insight. Um, you know, and, and if a young kid is listening to this, um, the reason this leadership is so important is because it affects every aspect of your life. I mean, you got to be, and you're, you're going to have children, you're going to have a spouse, you're going to have family, you're going to have cousins, Thanksgivings, Christmas parties, I mean, neighbors, patients. I mean, the people business is every part of life. I mean... Right. You know? Right. Which makes uh, me realize, looking back, I should have just became a cloistered monk. I should have just left high school, left Bishop Carroll High School, joined the Catholic monastery, and became a monk. That's what my oldest sister did. She, do you she, think you were a bad leader? What's that? Do you believe that you were a bad leader? Oh, no, but I think that, um, I don't think I'm a bad leader at all. I think uh, the people that are good leaders are the ones that um, uh, value it, think it's important. So if you if you realize this is something you need to know, then that's ninety percent of the problem. Getting your your head in the right area, say, oh, this is valuable. So then let me digest a ton of books on it. Let me, you know, think about what I'm saying, how I'm saying it, and self improvement. I, I think the uh, I think I think one of the biggest things I've seen with successful people, whether it be dentists or whatever, is a insatiable curiosity to just keep learning more and more and more. And I think all dentists, anybody who goes to eight years of college and became a dentist is intellectually curious. I'm just trying to focus their curiosity away from just clinical to this soft stuff because, I mean, the soft stuff is more important than the hard stuff. End of story. It's what pays the bills. I mean, in, in the long run, you can do all the fillings in the world, but if someone's not billing insurance, collecting co-payments, following up on insurance if needed, and knows what systems should be in place to do those things, you're not going to get paid anything. And, you know, it's kind of funny because, um, you know, when you're a small family office and you're doing 600, 700,000 a year and you got a dentist, two assistants, one or two hygienists, one or two front office, you can have a lot of um, problems, but they're just little bitty chihuahua dogs. But I've noticed that sweet spot somewhere between a million and two billion where those problems that were never fixed in the early days became a Tyrannosaurus Rex and brought down the whole office. I mean, I've talked with uh, one of my friends, uh, a consultant up the street here from me in Phoenix, and we're like, man, between one and two million, uh, if you didn't get your foundation set straight, you're, you're going to crash. Whereas most dentists thinking, well, God, if you got that $2 million of fillings, you, 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 everything would be perfect. No, no, that's just not true at all. No, it's absolutely not. And it, you're right. It's you have to have your systems into place in while you're in the sweet spot and while you can 
while you're still building your practice and building your team, I consider, you know, the $500,000, $600,000 range still building um, before you're ever going to really have success past that million dollar mark. Because if you hit that million dollar mark, I've, and I've seen it happen, I'm sure you have, and you don't have your systems into place and you're not a good leader, uh, you're going to see the numbers drop back down. Okay, let's you know, in the MBA school, the thing I enjoyed the most was just case studies, where they would just show an eight-page case study of a, of a, a business that had a problem. Here's a solution. Uh, lo, lo, everybody listening right now is probably all by themselves. They're probably 85% of them are alone in a car commuting to work, and podcasts um, is, is basically talk radio. That's what it is. Um, who's calling you? Go over some case studies, like because they're thinking maybe I'm too young to call you, or maybe or, or what? Who's calling you? What what is your bread and butter case? It's just, generally I have the forty somethings calling me that have finally realized that they didn't have all the answers to running a dental practice. <laughs> it, took, it took them forty years to reach humility. Well, I mean, they're in their 40s, is what I mean by that. They're in their 40s, early to mid 40s, and they're starting to realize their retirement account's not as it, as they like it. Their overhead's too high. They're finally starting to look past everything clinical. Um, the other ones I'm finding are new practice owners, are my other are my other clients. And so, how old's a new practice owner? Usually between 28 and 31 is when I'm. Okay, so let's start with the first one. Um, who are the 40-somethings? Why are they calling you? What are you doing for them? And what percent of the time uh, do they listen, implement it, and does it work? And what percent of the time do you just like, okay, this guy's not going to listen to anybody? Yeah, you do find that. Um, if they're desperate enough when they're calling you, they finally do list, listen. Some of them are divorced, um, and I'm sure you know that story very well. But bottom line is... you. We go in and we look at the practice. I do a practice assessment, and it tells me everything I need to know about the practice. Um, how, how do you do that? You, you dial into their practice management system long I, distance? No, no. I, I send an assessment for the practice, and if they don't want to do it prior to my visit, I bring it in with me and do it there, and then I go over it with the doctors or doctor and or office manager if they want them included. And it and it really does break down. The, and I do a practice potential analysis as well with that. And it breaks down the systems that are lacking. And a lot of times it's, it, it can be anything from like 59 pages of outstanding insurance claims that haven't been um, followed up on delinquent accounts, AR with over 50% of the AR out over 90 days. It can be um, recall systems that aren't being worked. It, it, you, it's just surprising to me the things that, that they don't know. And these doctors hire these staff members, and they're assuming that the staff members know everything they need to know to run that front desk, right? But then they won't invest in CE for the staff member to to learn how to do it and that's what's happened with this one practice with the 59 pages of outstanding insurance claims i mean the the girl told them she knew what to do but she didn't she didn't even know there was a an outstanding insurance claim report button but you know but what does that say about the dentist who's on dental town till three o'clock in the morning debating which is the best bonding agent and if he should switch from generation one through eight to whatever you can hallucinate on LSD and doesn't know that 50% of his account receivables are over 90 days. I mean, well, that's one of the first things I teach my clients is how to read reports and what reports to read. End of day reports, end of month reports, end of year reports, how to read them, why they're important. Actually start looking at your profit and loss if you get one. If you don't have one, start receiving one and paying attention to it and paying attention to the categories that are on there and watch your staff overhead, watch your supplies, watch your lab fees, depending on CAD chem or not, watch your, um, watch, just watch all of your expenses and make sure that 
you're take, making a profit. Um, and as far as end of day reports, you would be shocked. Maybe you wouldn't, but those doctors you just mentioned would be shocked to know how much money they're leaving on the table every day. Because every practice I have where I ask my doctors and their staff to go back and look at the end of day report and make sure that every procedure they've done that day is on it without fail daily. There are procedures that someone forgot to put on the, to report. Someone forgot to put in. And tens of thousands of dollars a year. And I've got doctors making more money just from that one simple little thing, paying attention to their end of um, day report, end of month report, pardon me. So, so, so you're saying that, and this is what I agree, that when an office doesn't do the end of day report and they, they look it over, that they, just just the missed dentistry done that wasn't entered, like a um, the hygienist forgot to enter the bite wings. Uh, uh, the dentist was doing a crown and decided to do the DO in front of it and the MO behind it, and and then the assistant didn't enter it. In. I mean, so you what would you say the for a dental office, the average median mode mute dental office who doesn't do it in a day, how much money in dentistry done that wasn't entered would you say is, oh, the, is they leave it on the table? Between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars. That's a year. Yes, a year. Fifty to hundred thousand years. So what would that be a day? It's twenty-five dollars an hour uh, is what they're uh, twenty-five to fifty dollars an hour that your dental office is open. You're leaving on the table just from an error in data entry because there's no end of day report. I mean that that's just crazy. Well, they and even the practices that are running one, the doctors don't want to look at it or the office managers don't want to look at it because they feel their their admin team feels like they're looking over their shoulder accusing them of not doing something right so i find one of the hardest things i do is talk my doctors into looking at this report daily they don't want to they don't want to mess with it yet they want to go <laughs> Kitty, that kitty. is Tigger, and she does not. She does not like me looking at you, and not him. Uh, Sorry, uh, Tigger. Uh, uh, so, have them. You know, they want to look at everything else as the cause of why they're not collecting the money or bringing in the money they think they should be, but they won't take that little bit of time at the end of every day to look at the end of day report. Yeah, but they'll look at Facebook, and that, that's how you learn how to make a lot of money with Facebook. And the number one thing you do on Facebook is delete your account. Because at the end of the day, you're looking at Facebook instead of looking at your end-of-day report. I, I, I think the most money a dentist could make in 2017 would be to delete their Facebook account. That's interesting. Really? Yeah. Their personal one, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're, I mean, they're always on Facebook, they're talking about the game, they're talking about this, and they're leaving 25 to $50 an hour because they don't have an end-of-day report. And when I, look, when I ask a dentist, every time I go to dinner with a dentist or talk to a dentist, all they want to talk about is uh, implants and bonding and CAD CAM. That's all they want to talk about. And then you say, well, what, what is your, uh, what is, what is your uh, labor? What, what is your overhead? How, what, what percent did you spend on marketing last year? Well, we did an ad. Dude, I didn't ask you if you did an ad. I said, what percent did you spend on more? I mean, it's like any question you ask them about the business, it's like a deer looking into headlights. And all they want to talk about is the wear rates on a filling. It's like, well, is that really what keeps you up at night? You put in fillings, they all wear down. And then they want to talk about bonding agents. Like, is that really your problem? You put in fillings, they all fall out. So basically, your problem is all your fillings wear down and fall out. Do they wear down first or, you know? And then, and then they say, well, actually, my problem is I'm, I'm broke. And then you start asking them all their business questions, and they don't know a single answer. They have no idea what their overhead is. They have no idea what their cost per employee is. They don't know how much it's costing them per day or per hour to have their employees. When you, and, but, and then if you mention, they may have an idea of what the employees are making per hour or per day, but they have no idea when you add in benefits and payroll taxes, what they're making and what their output is for that. And I also want to tell them that when they're at the study club and they add, uh, the, you know, most small towns have a, you know, one a study club, you know, the last Thursday of every month, they have a, a, a 
rubber chicken rice pilaf dinner and a speaker and they all go home feeling bad because the idiot next to them said, yeah, my overhead's about 50%, and yeah, I'm, 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 I'm taking home about 200, and the, the guy's completely clueless. A hundred percent of all the dentists that told me what their overhead was and what their net was, when you go in and actually look at the real numbers, they were only off like by a small Grand Canyon. <laughs> so that's, so, that's a so don't, don't listen to any of the numbers that the, the man sitting next to you at the study club is saying because just they've never been right. I've never seen them with the right number. And, you know, that's all they do listen to is each other. Yeah. They refer to each other for their practice management um, culture, their, the way they run their the way they run their office, they go to lunch and they talk about it and then they go back and that's how they do it. You know, is the way someone else does it. And Which is kind of like reading that book uh, for marriage advice, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, written by a man who was divorced five times. Oh, I didn't know that about him, but yeah, yes. So, so, when, so when you're getting marriage <laughs> advice and it just explains that, that, you know, you're both are a different planet, remember, you know, so, yeah. I kind of already knew that. Okay, I want to I want to pin you down for some details. Go over what you're looking at at the end of day, end of month, end of year. Talk talk about those three okay. reports. The end of day, you want to, again make sure all the procedures are are written down. But you also want you want to look and see what the what the over counter collections were, and make sure that that all of your all of your collections match your um, deposit sheet. That's one thing helps prevent embezzlement, right? And what percent of the offices uh, that you've been in in your career were that you find out they were being embezzled? What percent of the offices that called you to do consulting did you f later find out were being embezzled? And some I still think are. 50% um, probably. Yeah. But if you ask David Harris, he says 60%, but he's the expert. I'm not. I just know about what I see. So, so you could almost say an in-office consultant is free because every in-office consultant that I've ever met in my life says the same number, 50%. Oh, really? Yeah. Half the dental office they've ever gone into are being embezzled. And that might be one of the reasons, if you're listening to this, Doc, that when you say, you know, I'm thinking about bringing in an in-office in consultant, you're going to have some very vocal employee saying how this is just a crazy idea, that's a waste of money, this is what we need to do, blah, 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 blah. And then you got to ask yourself, why is this person so motivated to me not have an in-office consultant? Well, it's the same reason they don't want anyone doing their job when they're on vacation. <laughs> They want. Uh, they tell the staff not to post any payments and not to file insurance while they're away, if they're away on vacation. They're rarely there. Uh, they rarely take vacation or sick days because they've got to protect their, their... And they always want to eat lunch in their office while everybody goes to Taco Bell for lunch. They want to stay in the office with the door closed and eat lunch by themselves. Right. But they're the only ones that can do these things. No one else knows how to do it right. If anyone else tries it, we'll mess it up. So, yeah, it's that's that's one of the reasons. Um, but if you don't close out the end of day, <laughs> you see what I'm doing? Do I, do it's I, like I do, look do around. I, do I look like I have hair now? I see uh, I lay on the, this white this white you, hair on my head. You do. Um, if if you don't look at the end of the end of day and then end of month, then you really don't know how you're doing. There's no way you could possibly know what percentage is being collected, how much of your practice is insurance. You need to know on a daily basis what's going on in your practice. Okay, so end of day <laughs> summary. So summarize end of day. End of day um, deposit, production, collections, and the end of day reports I like <laughs> also show the month to date and the year to date on that day sheet so you can you can actually see how you're doing year to date and month to date on your end of day sheet it shows and on that and, and what i should ask before there's men there's a lot of young kids listening to this what practice management software do you like when, when you look at end of day reports uh you know there's over 300 dental practice management software companies any any of your faves any ones you don't like 
I do have favorites. What are they? I'd rather not. <laughs> Come on, it's dentistry I, uncensored. Okay, okay. Honestly, I like Eagle Soft and Dentrix. To be quite honest, that's what I like. So, I think Eagle Soft is like dental practice management software for dummies. I think anybody can figure Eagle Soft out. I think Dentrix probably goes more in depth with um, reports, and you can get a lot more in depth with it. But it's a little more complicated. That's my honest opinion. Well, you know, Eagle Soft was started in Effingham, Illinois. Uh, which is where Heartland Dental was started. In fact, the guy that I think started EagleSoft went on to uh, be a CEO of Patterson, and now I think uh, uh, that when they moved home to retire, now now they're uh, back working for uh, Heartland. I mean, so so it's a it's a small town. I mean, Effingham's only ten thousand people. You know where Effingham is? No, I'm right in the middle of Effing nowhere. It's about three hours south of Chicago. So, so you like Eagles off the most, and you think Dentrix the second? I like them both. I like them both very, very well. What, what, about, what about Open Dental? I do like it, and they're and I think they're I think they're making a lot of improvements on it. Um, and I think if I just need to know more about it, I'm okay. just not. Familiar so you did end of day. Now let's move to end of month. EOMs. End of month, you see what, what everyone's produced for the month. You can see what each hygienist did it, because it should have a production by procedure by provider report broken down. Um, and you can see what each dentist did. You can actually see how many procedures were done in the practice for the month. And you can look at, that's where I pull my perio numbers and to see what percentage of hygiene is perio. I pull... Um, to see what they're doing, if they're doing oral cancer screenings, because whether they charge for them or not, I, I ask my offices to at least put put the code on there, because eventually the ones that aren't being paid for will eventually be paid for the more often you file. We know that. We live through the day of when sealants weren't covered with insurance, right? right. Now sealants are covered. How did they get covered? Because we kept on filing and kept on filing and kept on filing and proved the benefit. So oral cancer screening is the same thing. Um, that's, why, that's why dental insurance companies will kick the composite fee over to the amalgam fee because every dentist in America who quit doing amalgam decades ago has not updated their amalgam fee for 25 years. So the insurance company is saying, well, the last submitted fee on an inclusive amalgam for this guy was like $78 back in 1979. And his occlusal composite is 250, so why not just kick it to the amalgam fee? So if every, you know, but but every, actually, but actually, that the, the format's changed because that was in the era of indemnity insurance. Now, 82 percent of dental offices are accepting PPOs, which tells you the fee. Um, when these 40 something well, dentists are calling you, is a big part of their problem um, because they've taken so many PPOs, or is that usually not the problem? No, a lot of it is they're taking PPOs, and again, that that administrative team person who doesn't know how to negotiate and how to look into ins PPO insurances and see what your choices are, you know, have just accepted anything that comes at them. And the doctor has no clue. 90% of the time, the doctor has no clue how much any of those insurance companies are paying for, for his two surface for composite. You know, he may ask about the crowns. He'll ask about the, or she will ask about the larger things, but they they really don't know what they're writing off. And I I do make sure my clients know every month exactly what they've written off and where those write offs came from. Well, you know, when I got out of school, the number one overhead was labor at 25, 28 percent. And number two was lab at 10, supply six. And now the number one overhead cost does not even show up on your P&L. It's adjusted production. Of their, uh, their, the average dental office in America is adjusting off 25% of production for these PPOs. And some of them are as high as 38%. Yet they think their they're, they're people, lab, and supplies are number one cost. Like, dude, your lab bill is 10%. You're buying a, a CAD CAM machine to... To reduce your your lab bill, your your adjusted production for your PPOs was thirty eight percent. 
and you, and you, and you're worried about. I mean, that that's like that's like going into your office and saying, "I'll sell my overhead. I'm going to put a lockbox over the thermostat because we got one assistant menopause and one who's anorexic and one who's overweight, and they're you know, and they're they're turning out you know that the, the light bill is the least of my concern and supplies. It's like then it's been all this time talking about how to save money on supplies. Like, dude. 25% of the overhead for the 211,000 licensed dentists in America is just adjusted production for PPOs. And you're worried about, you know, your dental supply bill? You're going to, what, you're worried about the price of gauze? <laughs> and they are. And, and the cotton rolls. Um, yeah, it's it's true. People um, seem to think that the answer is to jump on every PPO there is. And I don't agree with that at all. <laughs> I'm I'm anti that, if at all possible. Luckily, I mean, I've got clients all over the country, but I'm still mostly in the, on the East Coast and some Southern. And it has, it's not affecting us as bad here as it is in Washington, California. You know, there, there are states where you, you really can't do much without it. Um, I actually still have some off fee for service practices. And I believe strongly in them, and that's where you have to start looking at the, at the patient experience, because patients will value what will value a different experience at your practice versus someone else. When you really point out to them that it, their bill may be a twenty dollar difference or a thirty dollar difference, which is more comfortable? Do they want to be in an assembly line dental practice, which is what PPO doctors they've got to move fast, and it. You cannot focus on the patient experience and be a high PPO practice. I don't. I don't believe it's possible. Okay, so summarize again the end of month report. Okay, the end of month. You want to see your production by procedure by provider report. That's important. You want to see what's what's going on there. You want to see the adjustment report, and it's the adjustment by category report is what you need. So you'll see which like. For instance, Delta Dental, Cigna, Aetna, what was written off there? How much was written off for professional courtesy? How much was written off for employees? How much was written off for bad debt? How many miscellaneous write-offs are there? That's my pet peeve. Miscellaneous write-offs, I don't think there is such, should ever be that category on an adjustment report. That always just drives me nuts. I said, Every write-off has a reason, right? <laughs> and um, so... Your adjustment report, your production by procedure by provider report. So you and then look at what procedures were done in that report in hygiene to see what your percentage of periodontal um, treatment is. You need well, we all know it needs to be about thirty percent, right? Right, thirty percent of hygiene, right? Somewhere around there, if not a little more, for perio, but rarely do you find that rarely do you find that yeah so now that we're at the end of the year um, what would be some uh, New Year's resolution goals uh, for uh, 2017 what, what, do, what do you think dental offices what, what, what do you think um, the low-hanging fruit <clears throat> achievable things that they could work towards easy internal marketing work towards more internal marketing well hey, treat your staff well too be a good leader but then work on internal marketing the free stuff the post-op phone calls i just do you know how excited it makes patients to receive a call from their actual dentist who has done if they've had an invasive procedure and i mean wisdom tooth removed are you making that call tonight howard um, <laughs> i love it when their husband answers and you say hey is shirley there I'm asking you calling. Uh, I'd rather I'd rather not say. Well, what is this regarding? Well, you'll have to talk to Shirley about that. Oh, Tell her it's Howard on the phone. Oh my God! Hopefully, you're the God, only one. God, I love that call. The the most favorite thing in all of dentistry is when you're working on a married lady and you're doing a rubber dam. She's got the rubber dam in her mouth. She can't go anywhere. She's on nitrous, and her and her iPhone's laying on the counter and it starts ringing. And you pick it up and answer and her husband. You go hello. Who's this? Like, well, who's this? What is is Ann there? Well, Ann's kind of busy, man. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and they're like flinging and wailing, trying to get the damn phone. <laughs> Please oh, don't tell 
tell me you tell the the, the husband what she's got in her mouth. Please. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I think that that's the one of the cheapest and the best internal marketing you can do is post off post off phone calls. I know it's a pain in the tail at first, but once you get used to it, and they tell everyone, your patients will tell everyone about it. Um, that's one of the um, things they should start doing is working more towards internal marketing. Pay attention to the little things in the practice, the patient experience, because that's what's going to start setting them apart. How many doctors actually ever during the day leave their office, walk out the door, and come in the patient entrance? How many people do that? How many practice owners do that? Very rarely. Do they know that there's cobwebs and cigarette butts and you know, just nastiness outside their front door. Um, and this is, of course, in smaller facilities, right, where there's, you know, maybe a townhouse or a standalone building. It's not in your big city Bank of America buildings and stuff. But it's amazing that they don't do that. And they need to do it, too, to see how their patients are greeted when they come in. Do, does How long does it take person at the front desk to look up and greet the patient and are they greeted with a smile you get one chance to make a first impression phone calls too make sure another tip have your staff answer the phone with a smile on their face I know it's I know it sounds silly but it's impossible to answer the phone with a smile on your face and sound grumpy think about it so work towards that Remember that you do only get the one chance to make a first impression, and it's usually on the phone. And if then, when they walk in the office, what are they seeing? Um, work on and the post out phone calls. Um, and you know, what, you know what? If, if you know every time it's New Year's, you know everybody has a list. Of all these things are going to do. They're going to you know stop smoking, stop drinking, lose ten pounds, and uh, all that stuff. Um, I, you know what happened? I'd like them to break for New Year's is um, one of the key differences I see between the people crushing it and the people not crushing it is the dentist not crushing it uh, when she's done doing a root canal, um, she just gets up and she leaves, she goes in her private office and shuts the door. Whereas the other one, my, my, my go-to hangout is always the waiting room. You know, you'll be walking a patient out, you'll go up there, you'll shake their hands, you'll crack a joke. Uh, everyone starts laughing, but I, I, you know, why are you back in your private office on Facebook talking to some, you know, some classmate or whatever on the other side of China when you got these people giving you money sitting up there in front? You need to always act like you're running for mayor. You should be up there pressing the flush. And then, you know, you, there's so many easy drinks. You say, okay, when I was back there working on your daughter, then you point to your receptionist, was Valerie up here drinking or was she working? And, you know, everybody's just laughing, just Creating that culture yeah. of just pressing the flesh, running for mayor, shaking hands. I mean, we just finished a huge election. And look at how many cities those guys went to, to all these little parades and fundraisers, just for a chance to go shake old man Farmer Joe's hand. And then you're back there sitting in your office on Facebook, and you could have gone up there and shook every hand in your waiting room. Agreed. Agreed. Treat your patients the way you would want to be treated, and go up and treat them more like family than as patients. Say thank you to them, and if they, if you think you need patients, ask them. Say, we just love you, and we would love more patients like you. If you have any friends or family that need dental care, we'd love to take care of them. That's one of the best things you can do. Um, other than post out phone calls uh, for internal marketing, seeing your patients on time, don't make them wait. And if you, if you do make them wait, try to apologize yourself is what I think. If the doctor can apologize, perfect. If not, the receptionist or front desk person, whatever, you, uh, should, should let them know what's going on and then the clinician who brings them back needs to apologize. I agree, and they're never in a hurry. I mean, what are they in a hurry to go home to, to watch you and your Wheel of Fortune? It's just what Aretha Franklin said, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. You know, it's all about respect, and when you just go in there and, and honor them and say, I am so sorry, and you shake their hand. I had some little kid in here, and he was swollen, or he wouldn't get numb, and they're like, oh, it's okay, it's okay. But it's, it's okay because you showed them respect. You acknowledge it. 
exactly. It's the same it, thing when they break, when a, the dentist breaks a file. You know, I look at these lawsuits. I got a bunch of lawyer friends in dentistry, and they broke off a root canal file, which is totally acceptable. I mean, look, look at all the cars. I mean, the cars are always breaking down. Transmission goes out. I mean, your car, before it has 150,000 miles, has been to the repair shop several times. Humans know stuff breaks. But, yeah. so, but the one that gets sued is the ones that didn't tell the patients. And all you got to do is like, oh, my God, Mary Fisher Day, I am so sorry. That darn file broke. Well, they don't sit there and say, oh, you broke it. They, they think the file broke. The transmission broke. Your tire hit a, got flat. I mean, shit happens. But you didn't respect them. You didn't acknowledge it. You didn't tell them. And then they find out three years later, four years later, five years later at a different dentist. And now you're getting a letter from the state board a lawyer, all this stuff, when it just could have been, when the when the next dentist said, oh, there's a file broken in there, the first thing he should have said is, oh, yeah, he told me, my God, he felt so bad. That file just snapped. That's that's my luck. I must be Irish and O'Murphy, the, the luck of the Irish, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Own up to what you do. No doubt about that. Let them know and apologize and document it. Document, document, document. <laughs> If you don't document it, it didn't happen. I want, right? I want to ask you another question. Um, you, you say, you know, you mostly work in the Northeast. And a lot, a lot of the kids coming out of school, uh, or did you say the Northeast or the East Coast? East Coast. So back to the East Coast. A lot of kids are coming out of school at 25, and they're thinking, is there better regions and better cities to go to than others? I mean, uh, you know, what, what would you, because I think demographics matter. If demographics don't matter, why don't you go start your dental office? Why don't you go open up in Syria today? Why don't you go to the Congo? Why don't you go to, I mean, if demographics don't matter, go to North Korea. Demographics do matter. But within this country, what would you tell a 25-year-old kid who said, I want to go where I have a better chance of being successful? What would you tell that kid? Honestly, rural, small town areas. I'm so passionate about this. Um, the rural areas, small towns are, are so underserved and and they need they need dentists. They, they look at their doctors as heroes. You go to a big city, everybody here wants to be in Charlotte or Atlanta or Boston or New York City or DC or Baltimore, the big cities they want, or Raleigh. They want to be in the big city and they don't even consider going anywhere else. I've got, a, I bet I've got 50 doctors looking for a practice in Charlotte, North Carolina right now. Probably 75 looking in Charleston, South Carolina. But what they don't think about is how they could be a hero and make more money. And because honestly, the fee schedules aren't that much different in smaller towns to big towns. I mean, it, it not, not enough that it makes a difference. The small town doctors are, are more respected. Patients tend to take what they say to heart um, and question, are less likely to question their judgment. And they have lower overhead, less stress. They're not expected to work on Saturday. They're not expected to have nighttime hours. They're just, you know, if they're, their word is gold to their patients. I believe, and it's a good quality of life. And what I tell these doctors is find a rural area where you're within an hour to a big city, an hour or so to a big city. So you can still go on the weekends if you want that culture, if you want a meal at Ruth's Chris or something. But be okay with the Western Sizzling on the, during the week or something, like something a little more on par with a small town. Um, but you can literally make some, have have a better retirement account, make more money, and be more comfortable if you practice in a small town or a rural area. But I'd, I'd want to go to Charlotte, though, personally, because I think Cam Newton is the most best-dressed man in the universe. That guy, his hat, scarves, bow ties, is that the best-dressed man in all of the world? He's, he's pretty well dressed, but I'll tell you, <laughs> officials don't like him a bit. They just let him get his butt kicked all over the field, and they don't care. Why, so, what, what, say that again? I miss that. The, we love him, but the officials, the NFL officials, could care less about him. 
they they let him get his butt kicked all over the field in the pocket out of the pocket it doesn't matter if helmet to helmet if somebody helps they're not going to call it but they'll call it when he gets up and gets mad well cam newton is the best dressed american i'll give i'll give him that 24 hours a day seven days a week so, but yeah it, you just got to go to rural i mean so six thousand students graduate two-thirds go to 117 metros where half of america lives and then the other third goes to where the other half of america lives in 19,000 towns and they do this every year because the big cities i mean i was lecturing in downtown denver the other day and i was staying at the, the hotel um i was looking out the window i could see mile high stadium i could see the baseball park i could see you know and that downtown is just so damn cool but so they want to live there but you need to commute there and the other thing I see in the suburbs is the average dentist that has an hour commute to work, they leave their home where there's a dentist for every 2,000. They commute an hour into the town. By the time they get out of their car, there's a dentist for every 350. But if they would have got up in their home at a dentist for every 2,000 and commuted an hour out of town, they would have got to where there was a dentist for only every 3,500. And those people, um, you know, are more likely to not even be on a PPO. And then the, the rent was significantly cheaper. Labor, I mean, in a small town rural market, $10 an hour is a rocking hot job. You go to downtown San Francisco or Denver, and people think they're underpaid at 25 Oh, yeah, absolutely. I see that every day. And what a lot of people forget about, too, especially the young dentists, if they go to rural areas, loan forgiveness. They can have parts of their loans forgiven by um, by the federal um, whoever's doing their student loans, or they or they'll be paid for them, depending on the state and the area they go to. Anywhere from a hundred thousand dollars to full forgiveness. Same thing with dental hygienists. Do you know any states like that on the East Coast? Yeah, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, all of those. Oh my God! Can you can you uh, post that information on Dental Town and then uh, and then uh, or email it to me because I'm aware of Iowa. Uh, Iowa has a program where if you they give you a list of cities and if you go there, the state of Iowa will give you a check for 100 grand and Delta Dental of Iowa will match it. Wow! Um, but um, I'm uh, but if you have uh, names of other states or or whatever, I, I would like to get that down because. Yeah, and, and, and you know, and you know, the only people who will go to rural, I mean, let's get this straight. It's the ones that are married and or married with a stay home wife and kids because they that's their party. Their party's in the house. They don't the, the person who will never go there is the single male who's one who will never take an emergency patient after five o'clock because they want to go hit happy hour and find all where all the girls are. And uh, so if you already have your own. Uh, traveling party. I mean, if you're married and have kids, who the hell cares where you live? Because you're just going to work and be home until if you're at least the first decade. Um, why not go rural and make twice as much money? Agreed. There's this practice in Western North Carolina outside a town called Murphy that's rural. The doctor does by himself 100% fee for service, 1.3 million. He does. He's got great staff, well-trained, beautiful facility. He nets, his net is over 600000 a year. He's wanting to sell his practice for 800 something but no one wants to go there because it's rural. They don't like the school systems. Can't they afford to put their kids in private school at, with $600,000 well, a year? School system is, the school system is the biggest malarkey anyway. I mean, if you believe in school, I mean... Basically, it's daycare. Nobody knows what to do with a five-year-old who's got a burger hanging out of his nose. So they put him in daycare, which they call school. And when they come out at the end of high school, they're, bar they're barely alive. I mean, they just got their car keys at 16. So then you send them to extended daycare at college from 18 to 22. And it's basically at 22 where this flower blossoms. So if you're worried about what school your kid goes to in the sixth grade, you're probably, you know, you're probably smoking pot. You did too much LSD in the 70s. I mean, it's daycare. It's a glorified daycare school. Get over it. Agreed. And these and when, people, I just had a doctor who, that's where he wants to be. But his wife said no because of the school system. And it's a rural area. 
it's six hundred thousand dollars living in a rural area but they're within an hour of atlanta two hours of charlotte you know not far from you know they're in they can drive a short distance and be about anywhere they want to and go. plus where would your kid rather go i mean i used i grew up in wichita kansas and it was so frustrating when Cops were always coming to my house because my kids are riding their motorcycles on the street, their go their go karts. They're you know we're we're in small rural America. You know no one cares, but in no downtown Phoenix, supposedly I guess the police officers aren't fond of you know kids riding their uh, motorcycles down the street. I mean they had you know so it's, it's a different culture. I'd rather grow up in the country and be able to ride my mini bike down the street and my BB gun and my 22 and it'd be a better lifestyle. And, and it would probably be a happier home if dad was making bank and mom was making bank as opposed to them coming home stressed out about how to make their student loan payments. Yeah, and that's the kind of house I grew up in. I grew up in a small town. One dentist, he got, he got student loan forgiveness for opening a dental practice in this little town. And this was many, many years ago in South Carolina. And um, he and his family grew up there. He had a son go to the NFL. He has a son now that's an oral surgeon. I was their babysitter. He has a daughter that's a PA. But we it all started in this little town in South Carolina, you know, where a doctor moved there because he could get student loan forgiveness. And he ended up living there, raising his family there. And he's the reason I'm in dentistry. So... It's it's interesting. I love, oh, I love that country living so much. When my four boys, Ryan here, said next when they were little, I used to always drive them way out in the country and kick them out of the car, then drive back home because I wanted them to live in the country. But they'd always find their way home. I don't know how they did it. But uh, my God, that was the fastest hour. We're we're uh, over an hour five. Um, your book is at uh, Amazon.com. Her website, thedentalbusiness.com. Uh, can they email you or call you? Do you want to give out any other information sure. or should I just go to the dentalbusiness.com? Sure, no, it's easy. Email Mary, M A R Y, at the dentalbusiness.com or they can call me at 704 Damn, that's a lot of zeros. You got four zeros on number 704 904 5070. Mary, Mary, your email is Mary, Mary, quite contrary. How does your garden grow at the dentalbusiness.com? That's a long email. That's that's a lot longer than I thought it was. Have you ever thought about shortening that just to Mary at the dentalbusiness.com? I, I actually did think about that. <laughs> about the time I bought the dental business domain. <laughs> hey, you ought, to, you ought to start a thread on Dental Town called um, Loan Forgiveness and um, or uh, send me that because uh, that is, uh, gosh darn, I don't know. And, and, the, and here's the craziest thing. They won't go to that small town to go make bank, but they'll join the Navy, Army, Air Force, Marines, and go sit in South Korea, um, you know, in Japan. They'll go sit in Afghanistan. It's like, really, dude, you're going to go sit in the middle of the Pacific Ocean because you didn't want to be an hour away from Charlotte? It's, it's, you're right. And, that, and that's the way it is. There's practice. There are little towns 45 minutes from Charlotte that are included in the student loan forgiveness and people don't want to live doctors don't want to live there they and, and then i talk to practice brokers when i start talking about what's the formula to evaluate the practice and they say okay now all these numbers these are for city urban practices because the rural practices they're really just illiquid assets because you're not going to find anybody to go there and buy it anyway it's like oh yeah you wouldn't want to go there and get rich yeah, yeah, join the Navy. Yeah, go sit, it's go, go sit in Okinawa for four crazy. years. Yeah, it's crazy. All right, well, Barry Fisher Day, love your work, big fan of you. Uh, thank you so much for coming on my show today and hanging out with my homies for an hour. Uh, I love the Christmas tree in the background. I hope you have a rocking hot Christmas holiday, and I can't wait to see you again. Thank you, Howard. I love it. It's so nice to meet you. All right.